You're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Find us on the web at jsparty.fm, on the Fediverse at JS Party, at changelog.social, and of course, wherever you get your podcasts, just search for JS Party, you'll find us. Thanks to our partners at Fly. Launch your app near your users for peak performance. Fly makes it easy. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, JS Party people. I'm K-Ball. I'm your host today, and I am doing another one of these fun deep dive interviews. I'm joined today with Tejas Kumar. Tejas, how are you doing, man? Hey, it's good to be here. I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks. I'm excited to have you on. I think we had you on the show once before, maybe a year or two ago, and we got deep into like the vibes and like how to have good energy and succeed. Today, we're doing a more focused technical topic, you have been getting really into a topic that's interesting to me, which is AI or LLM agents um, and doing it in JavaScript, which is different than what I've been doing it in. So I'm really excited to get into there, but let's like maybe kind of start, give our listeners a little bit of a background if they didn't listen to that old episode, who you are, how you got into this stuff. Um, and it feels like a bit of a shift from where you started. So yeah, kind of curious how you got here. Yeah, I'm Tejas. Uh, if you didn't listen to the last episode, no no worries. I have been a web engineer for most of my life. I got into it as a kid from, from age eight, just sort of building things with the front page and Dreamweaver and had an internship at 15. And I'd, I'd say that's where my professional career began. And then, you know, i um, just sort of been doing that for the past 16 years. Eventually, um, you know, some people, some leaders um, recognized that I had a gift for communication. Specifically, I'm talking about Guillermo Rausch from Brazil, who um, asked me to come lead developer relations at, at Zeit back then for a little while. Um, and that was sort of my getting into developer relations, which was where I was when we did the last um, JS Party episode. I was the director of developer relations at Zeta, which is a serverless database company. And there, you know, it's run by some great friends. And yeah. And, and today, um, as you mentioned, I'm doing a lot of AI. I, I work as a developer relations engineer for generative AI or Gen AI at, at Datastax. And what my whole job is to live and breathe Gen AI and understand it as deeply as I can so I can teach it with as much quality and as much fidelity as I can. Um, so Datastax is heavily focused on RAG. That's like bringing real-time context into prompts that we send to large language models. And so we help them like come up to date and hallucinate less. But, you know, there's also the whole other side of the equation, which is agentic workflows, which is which is where I've been spending a lot of my sort of extracurricular time, let's say, where, um, you know, this technique RAG, for those listening, it stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, and, and essentially, as a developer, you retrieve some data and you give it as a prompt to the LLM and you use it to augment the generated output. So that's RAG. But with agentic workflows, this changes a little bit where instead of you, the developer, doing the retrieval, the LLM itself can sort of recognize when it's time to call the tool. That's actually just one tenant. Agent, I'm happy to talk about agent workflows in a broader uh, sense, but RAG initiated by agents where they themselves retrieve data is, is something that I've also been working on. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, let's maybe start with agent because I feel like that is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Sometimes I feel like people use agent to mean anything that is, I don't understand what it means, but it's going to do something for me. So how do you define what an agent is in this sort of new world? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I just follow a number of experts' uh, definitions of this thing. I, I, I tend not to try and coin terms myself, um, mainly because I'm just not very credentialed, if we're being honest. But uh, So how do I see agents? I summarize it. I summate it. I'm trying to find the right word. I deduce it from definitions from industry experts who have gone before me. So people like Andrew Ng, the founder of Coursera, and now the founder of deeplearning.ai. I think he's got some great content about this where he defines agentic workflows as workflows that have LLMs perform three tasks, either all three or a subset of them. Um, and those are reflection, meaning generate some output and, tell, and reflect on it. Is it good? Is it not? And then like iteratively work on it until it cannot be improved further. So there's reflection. There's tool calling, as I mentioned, with RAG, where the, where the large language model will sort of like a human being, right? Recognize, for example, if you ask me to do a complex calculation, like 
324 divided by nine times seven. I, I'd just be like, it's time to get a calculator. I'll just, I'll recognize that this is the sort of boundary of my capabilities and go use a tool. So number two is tool calling. Um, and number three was, I, I think it was agent collaboration where you have, yeah, it's LLM as judge. It's this model where a capable model, pun intended, coordinates lesser capable models towards an outcome you want, right? So it's like GPT-4.0 being the most capable of OpenAI's models it would orchestrate like three or four different 3.5 turbo models that are doing various tasks or generations. And so those three, either one of them or all of them, make up, according to Andrew Ng, an agent workflow. According to David Korshid, the like AI agents are an implementation of the actor model, which is just a programming model where you have an entity called an actor that, that sort of acts in response to observing its environment. So the classic implementation of the actor model is Pac-Man, actually a great example of AI, but rule-based AI where the rules are known ahead of time is Pac-Man, right? Where you have Pac-Man, the little yellow uh, pizza thing, and it's observing the environment, where the ghosts, where the cherries, where the dots, and you as the, as the player take on the role of the actor, right? Um, but there's also demo mode where the actor model is in play. Um, and according to David Korshid, this implements agentic workflows. Um, however, it's rule-based, it's not generative, but it's still an agentic workflow where Pac-Man is an agent. So I just take a mishmash of those two. These are the preeminent leaders in the space in my mind and you know marry them. And that's the working definition that I have for agent. So it's not a sentence, it's not a nutshell, but I'm trying to give you more sort of a broad framework of how I see agent workflows. I have seen this term abused where people will build, maybe abused is too strong, but people will build a custom GPT. This is a feature you can use um, from OpenAI's GPT-4. And they'll just build a custom GPT, add a system prompt, add some like knowledge that GPT-4 can do rag on and call this an agent. I disagree. I don't think that's an agent. That's just a rag application. It doesn't really do any of the things like we talked about, reflection, tool calling, collaboration, or observing an environment and responding accordingly. So I'd say those four tenets make an agent an agent. Interesting. Maybe another way we could take this is like, what what would you use an agent for? When is this the right tool to sort of pull out of the tool chest. Yeah, I think, you know, the term agent is so cool, right? Because it applies to human beings and we tend to anthropomorphize AI a little bit. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not qualified to make that judgment, but I think it's the same. When would you use a human agent? For what? And this this maybe will trigger some doomers, like, oh my gosh, they're going to take our jobs. I think it will take jobs. There's no question about that. Um, and so I, I think it's good to be prepared, but I would use, so for example, I have a podcast. We actually use Riverside, the application we're using to record this. And, you know, Riverside has some great capabilities with webhooks, as does cal.com, which is a really great scheduling tool. And so wh what we use agents for is to orchestrate across a variety of webhooks operations that a team of people would do. And so my podcast is run entirely by some AI agents. It's not fully automated end to end, but for example, like if, you know, you schedule a an episode with me, depending on which scheduling link you use, one is experimental where we experiment and use the agent workflow and the other one is just manual, right? So if you schedule with an agent link, what will happen is it will immediately, as soon as the event is scheduled, will fire off an agentic task to discover you. So who is Kevin Ball? What? Okay, this email address in the calendar invite, let's go find where it occurs on the internet and okay, GitHub, okay, Twitter, okay, Google. And then it's going to um, find out things that you're passionate about. The whole point of my podcast, Contagious Code, is to take what people are passionate about and make that contagious to the listeners. And so it will find, literally, this is the task to, that the agent has. It finds what you're passionate about and then will construct like a a discussion outline for the length of our discussion and then upload that to probably GitHub or Google Drive. We're still deciding. I, right now it's gists on GitHub. So if you go on my GitHub gist, there's a bunch. I'm using my access token. So just like they'll make the discussion outlines. Um, and then it will attach that link to the calendar invite, right? So then when we come to record, we both have the discussion. The, the job is done. After we record, there's similar post-processing steps. All of this, you know, used to be done by people, but doesn't need to be anymore. So where would I use agents? It's the same place I would use human agents as, as much as I can. Yeah. So are you building those yourself? Yeah. Um, I actually am building and have, well, I, I've built a framework similar to Next.js. I've showed you this um, off podcast where, you know, you just define a bunch of tools. And the large language model will, just like a human being, will recognize when, okay, I don't know. So for example, go find out what Kevin Ball is passionate about. If you don't have the right tools, the large language model will be like, hey, listen, I, I, I can't 
I don't like you go to GPT 3.0. Or it will confidently make something up and it'll be like, hey, right, Kevin even Ball worse. Is this person over there. I mean, for my name in particular, it there's a couple famous people with that name. And so it would probably huh. tell me that, uh, tell you that I'm a football player or an actor or something like that. Right. Which, you know, you, you maybe are. But, but, um, exactly. And, and if you go to GPT 3.5 Turbo, for example, it will just say, I, I don't have the, uh, the capacity to browse the internet, something like that, right? But the moment you introduce these tools, it can do that. And so it's iterative. It's up to the developer in developer land to just define a bunch of tools and pray to the AI gods that it will use it. How the AI actually knows when to call the tool is part of its training data. And as we know, OpenAI doesn't make any of that public, but Meta does. And so does Mistral. So you can just pick your model. That you can also, and I do run this stuff locally, so it's not in someone's cloud where they can steal my data. Since it's really just single user, I, I run this totally like at home, right? I've got Olama, I've got Mistral 8x22b, which has support for function calling. It just, it works on a single device. It doesn't need to scale because it's not mass market yet, so. Yeah, well, and so for this audience who is probably, well, maybe they're playing with these tools, maybe they're not. Olama is... Yeah, good, good. Thanks for mentioning Olama. So if anyone's familiar with Docker, I suspect they are. It's a JS party and we've probably built like a Node.js server and Dockerized it. Um, so Docker is a way to run servers and things, software in, in what are called containers. These are abstractions on a virtual machine. So it's just a nice isolated environment. The team from Docker, a large portion of them quit and went to start and join a company called Olama. And Olama is basically like Docker, but for LLMs, like the syntax. So you have a you have a Olama file, it's called a model file. So like a Docker file, it's literally, the concept overlap is in, incredible. Like in Docker, you have a Docker file. With Olama, you have a model file and you write syntax that looks exactly like Docker file, right? From, and then you specify the base model. So Mistral 7b. And then you can add like a system prompt. You can do a bunch of stuff. If you just have a from statement and using the CLI type Olama run, it will run that model locally for you. And then you can, you know, just use it like you would an LLM. Um, generate me an email, ask questions about whatever. It will do it locally on your GPU. The cool thing about Olama is it's a centralized effort to be able to run large language models across a variety of hardware architectures. So it will, if you download it for Mac OS Silicon with Apple Silicon, it will just work. If you download it on Windows, it will, it's like the Docker principle as well. So it's really cool. So you can use Olama to then, I also mentioned some models that maybe people aren't exposed to every day, GPT-4 and GPT-3, and these are the models behind chat GPT um, that OpenAI gives you. But OpenAI is highly controversial because they are not public. Nothing is open about this company. It's the whole thing about like you name yourself to cover up your greatest weakness, right? They are open yeah, AI yeah, because just, they are not open at all. Yeah, he just called me like Rich Tages or something because I'm really not, um, or something, you know, and so their weights, their actual models, not open source. Um, the training data, not open source. They don't really publish papers as often as things like Google Brain or um, even Meta. I think Meta is doing a tremendous good job, a really good job of um, being open with the, Meta should have a department called OpenAI and it'll actually be open. In any case, maybe you don't want to use those models. There's a French company called Mistral, I say that proudly as a resident of the European Union, that has a bunch of open source models. These models are fully open source. You can clone them locally, you can tweak them, you can fine tune them, you can do whatever you want. And so what I run is Mistral 8x22b. This is their largest open source model that has support for function calling. And I run that with Olama. So Olama is an inference engine, to answer your question in a super long-winded way. Olama is an inference engine that you can run either locally or in the cloud, and then you pair that with a, la a language model, and then you basically can build your own chat GPT. Awesome. So let's come back to your agent framework. You showed me a little bit. You said it's like Next, it's in, just in JavaScript. Is that open source? Can people play with it? Not yet, mainly because... I feel like in my mind, and I may be wrong here, but in my mind, before I open source something, I want to make sure it's it's already useful, but I'm not sure it's clean enough. You know, it's it's sort of like how you get dressed before you go out, usually, ideally, hopefully. It's not dressed. And so not yet. Also, there's people, um, friends, Sunil Pai from PartyKit and David Kurshid from Stately working on exactly the same thing. And theirs is open source. So David um, has stately.ai slash agent. That's his agent library, and that's fully open source and uh, ready to go. I think he's still working on the documentation, but it will be soon, if not already done. And so if you were starting today, would you use Stately or would you still build your own? No, I'd build my own. I, I've, I've always built mine. You know, like I, I really don't you do... You built your own React, right? That was your famous talk for a while. Yeah, I don't do like NPM create next app. 
I, I will like, instead what I'll do is NPM init, NPM install react, react dom next, and I'll like bootstrap everything myself, you know, because I, I sort of like that control. I, I think it's sort of like the car enthusiasts who will only drive stick shift, even though there's, you know, some would say better ways. It's, it's like that. I, I like the, the raw control. It's so hard to get a stick shift in the States these days. Mm. Not really. Yeah. Nobody carries them anymore. It's really depressing. I wonder if we can do a an electric stick shift. How would that work? That'd be I so don't interesting. Think it, I mean, <laughs> it's a total sideline, but electric motors, part of the advantage is that they don't they can continuously apply torque throughout all those. So you don't need to shift gears in the same way. Yeah, but you want to feel something. It's it's like the way that they, they have um they will play engine sounds, right? For the electric. Like Yeah. <laughs> the the Hyundai Elantra, the new electric one, is just absolutely bananas. They actually have like paddle shifters. It's electric, it's fully electric, but they have paddle shifters and they mimic the torque. It, it's it's wild. What's up, friends? I'm here with Faraz Abugadije, founder and CEO of Socket. Socket helps to protect the best engineering teams out there with their developer-first security platform. And so, Faraz, speaking of developer-first, Socket is developer-first. What does that mean? What do you mean by being developer-first? Most security software is typically sold to executives, so it tends to suck to actually use it. (laughs) So the company, the vendor goes in and makes a sale, the executive thinks it looks good, but they don't actually care at all what the developer experience is of the tool. So I think that's where I would start. The first problem with security tools is they're sold to executives. In the best case, those tools get purchased and they just sit around on the shelf bothering nobody and protecting nobody. But in the worst case, they get rolled out and they prevent developers from getting things done. And they just get all up in your face with alerts and pointless noise that isn't actionable. And if you actually go and fix those alerts, you're not even improving security. Because a lot of the time, those vulnerabilities are super low impact. That's like the dirty secret of vulnerabilities is most of them are low impact. They're either in dev dependencies, so they're never going to run in production, or they're really difficult to exploit. Or if you exploit them, there's nothing really there. It's like a a denial of service uh, in some random component. And in reality, like that's just such a low risk in terms of just your priorities of things you need to work on as a developer. I I would actually say probably 90 or 95% of the vulnerability alerts that developers are used to seeing from other tools are just completely pointless. They're just fake work. And fixing them doesn't even meaningfully improve security at all. Dang, tell it like it is for us. That's the status quo. Uh, We come in as Socket and we're like, look, there are real threats out there. We see packages getting hijacked, getting compromised every day. Like this happens on an hourly basis. If you go to the Socket website, socket.dev, you can see uh, we have a feed of packages that we've identified. And a lot of them are in the last couple hours. We've seen malicious code go up on NPM. So this is like a real threat. So the first thing we do is we just say, look, let's focus on those threats. Those are intentionally introduced attacks. Those are code that you never want to run even once on your system. You never want to ship that to production because you're going to lose customer data. You're going to lose you know, your personal data on your laptop. And you need to identify those threats before you install those packages. And in order to do that, you need to be proactive. And that's what Socket does. We're really trying to bring to light the real threats that matter. And that's the whole design behind Socket to be that way for developers. Well, there you have it. Protect yourself, your team, and your software from the threats that really matter. Don't do fake work. Use Socket, Socket socket.dev, that's S-O-C-K-E-T dot dev, book a demo, install the GitHub app, install the Socket CLI, whatever it takes to take the next step, do it, go to socket.dev, again, socket.dev. Let's say somebody wanted to follow your footsteps and build it from the ground up because they wanted to explore all the different pieces. How do you interact from JavaScript with these models? Like what what does that end up looking like? This is a great question. It's not difficult. I wanna I wanna just preface by saying that. And and you know, people say, Oh Tejas, but you say it's not difficult, and then you tell us to do a difficult thing. Yeah, you built React I, on a in a 30 minute uh yeah. or maybe it was yeah. an hour talk, right? It really like it just takes a I hope I'm not being like, you know, difficult about this, but I, I think it just takes a little bit of thought. So how do you do it? You, I, I regret now wearing this black t-shirt based on what I'm about to say, but you you would use the Vercel AI SDK. <laughs> oh my gosh. But it, I'm getting like flashbacks to my old job at Zyte. Anyway, um, the Vercel AI SDK is a really great piece of software. And it, again, it's not, it's very capable, but I use it because I'm confident I could build it given the time. 
right? I, so for my thing with abstraction is I typically don't trust black box abstractions unless I know how they work on the inside. And then I'm like, yeah, cool, this saves me a bunch of time. If I don't know how they work on the inside, I tend to be uncomfortable to the point where I have to build it myself or at least a bare bones like, like I did with React so that I understand kind of what's happening. Okay, so the Vercel AI SDK, what does it do? It's, it's pretty cool. You, you, there, it exports a function called create AI and you can give it a language model to talk to. Think of it as an abstraction on top of like the OpenAI API SDK, OpenAI SDK and the Mistral SDK. So a lot of these large language model as a service companies like OpenAI and Mistral and Replicate and whatever, they all have SDKs. And the SDKs are not standardized. Like JavaScript is a standardized programming language, right? But these SDKs aren't standardized. And so if you want to, if you build your entire company on like OpenAI's GPT-4, oh, and then you're like, oh, this is way too expensive. We need to shift to self-hosted Mistral. That's going to be painful, like changing from one API, one SDK, excuse me, to another. And so the Vercel AI, AI SDK is a general SDK where you can just swap out the language model pretty easily. And that it can do that because it, the language model is just a, an input parameter and the functions you call use that input parameter. So it's very nice and standardized. So I would use that. With the AI SDK, they have, as part of the model that you give as the input parameter, you also can pass in an array of tools. And what, what, what is a tool? A tool is just a function, literally an async JavaScript function that does a task and returns a message. So think of it this way. When you call the OpenAI API, right, and you send a prompt, the role of the message you're sending is user, and the content of this message is convert for me 100 US dollars into euros. That's the prompt. Now, if there's no tools, the response will be, I don't know how to do that with today's exchange rate, but here's some nonsense based on some exchange rate I imagined. It won't say that, but that's what, that's what you get. It will confidently tell you the wrong answer. Yeah, unfortunately. It won't even say this is nonsense. And so that's how you would call the SDK. But when you add in tools as this input parameter, how does a tool look? A tool, indeed, it's just a function, but this function also has metadata. So the metadata has a description, and it's literally just a plain text description, and a schema of input parameters. And this is just a Zod schema. So it's a, it's a JavaScript object. You can have keys and values, right? And so based on the description of the metadata of the tool, the large language model will call it because it's a language model. And the, the tie here is really language. So if the description of your tool using the Vercel AI SDK is get the current exchange rate or get a list of current exchange, that's the description. Then the language model will see, okay, it's just vector similarity, right? We'll see the input prompt contains exchange rate. I don't know. This tool contains exchange rate. I'm just going to call this and hope for the best. And that tool will return a message. So we talked about the role being user and the content being your prompt. The tool will return a message where the role is tool call and the content is whatever that function returned as a string. And so then OpenAI um, or the large language model has been trained to recognize the JSON where the type is tool call and will take that and add it to its context. Aha, now the exchange rates are this. I'm going to, I got this from the tool. I'm going to generate some text for you. So it's, this is RAG really. Um, tool calling is RAG because it did retrieve the exchange rates and then used it to generate its own output to augment its own generated output, I should say. But yeah, that's how the AI SDK works. How would I build this? It's exactly like that. I would add the AI SDK to my project, create an instance of their AI inference function object, and pass in a bunch of tools, and then just send prompts to it. That, and that basically is just my, this is why also I don't feel like open sourcing it, because it's not like revolutionary. It's just using another library. Also, Stately's AI agent framework, is exactly the same. Also, Next.js is exactly the same. It's just using React in an opinionated way. But Next.js is open source, so maybe I should open source my thing. But I think you should. Yeah. I think you should absolutely open source it. It's part of, the, I mean, even if it's not ready, say it's not ready, but you're learning in public and you're showing people, you're talking about it. I'd love to see how yeah. you do it. One caveat with this, though, is that it does get very expensive. This is why I, I opt to run the models locally, because then it's free. But to run this at scale, like as in like multi-user workloads is going to always be expensive at this point in time. So that's something people should probably know about. Yeah, well, and that moves into a topic area around gotchas for this. And like one that I've definitely noticed playing with these tools and then trying to help developers use these tools is I think calling LLMs 
artificial intelligence maybe gets in the way of people using them well, because if you think of them as intelligence, you expect them to be able to, for example, infer things that to a human seem the same. But yeah, going back to your tool description, like the text of that description is really important. It should linguistically be very close to the language that will trigger <laughs> when it wants to do this. Yeah. There, there's one caveat here because they can also translate. This is absolutely bananas. If somebody's speaking Korean with the language model and is like, you know, convert this currency in Korean, it will still do it because the the vector dimensional space transcends like language the way we know it. And I think that's very cool. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And they, they are very powerful. And when I've used them sometimes, like it's, it's similar to what you're talking about in terms of black box. These are sort of black boxes. Yeah. And the lines between what works and what doesn't, for example, referencing a tool call often are unintuitive. I'm trying to think of a good example, but like using language that to me might mean the same thing will not trigger it at all. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. Um, and I think this is why I, I did go a level deeper and, you know, just trained my own model that does tool calling, which now I, I see it, you know, I see the matrix, so to speak. And I, I think it's very important to always look at the, the person behind the curtain. Yeah. And so we, I'm happy to go down that trail if you want. And we actually have an episode on, on my podcast with um, Kyle Corbett, the founder and CEO of a company called OpenPipe that does fine tuning as a service. It's very cool. I, full disclosure, I'm an investor, so I, I need to disclose that. But he is just, you know, a, a genius about fine tuning and tool calling and machine. Learning. He's got a background in this stuff. He's had it for years. And so he was able to teach me a lot. And I did eventually come up with a large language model, completely my own, that can call the right tools and so on. And like, it's, it makes sense now. So. so when you do that, are you also implementing that in JavaScript, the wrapping around it? Or is it like, how does that work? Yeah, you can't. As far as I know, so I haven't fine-tuned models in JavaScript, mainly because I need access to my GPUs, which I know you can do with TensorFlow.js. I just haven't, the, the tooling in Python is just fundamentally different and fundamentally better. Like you've got so many, you could like NPM install the ecosystem of things you can use in Python for your machine learning workflows are just unparalleled. And really this is the great gap. Like if, if the JavaScript ecosystem wants to mobilize and like create like an equivalent level of tooling that Python has in JavaScript, we could really like take over the space. Um, but for whatever reason, we don't have it. Um, what am I talking about? Well, specifically Hugging Face, the company, um, for those who maybe don't get to play with this, Hugging Face is like GitHub, but for machine learning models. People can upload their models there and fork them and clone them and download them, do whatever they want, at least the ones that are open source. Um, so Hugging Face is just the biggest contributor to the Python ecosystem. They have a great library called Transformers. This thing is bananas. It's, it's like the the bedrock of all fine tuning operations that, that you would do maybe as an enthusiast. I can't speak for like academia and research and people with H100s from NVIDIA, but for me with my Apple Silicon, like Hugging Face Transformers comes with so many great declarative abstractions out of the box. For example, you instantiate a trainer, it's a class, and you give it a bunch of hyperparameters. Like this is my, I want this many epochs, epics, epochs, however people say it. I, ha I want um, this learning rate and so on and so forth. And then once you've configured this instance, you literally just call trainer.train. How cool is that? And it, it will do that. And it will look for a GPU. If, if you have one, it's called an MPS device, or it will try it best effort to do it on your CPU and will probably crash your system. I've crashed my computer many times, but all of this in JavaScript is just at this point in time, not as accessible because of the ecosystem as it is in Python. Interesting. So something you talked about there, you said you've crashed your computer and you are running everything locally. So how, like, what are the gotchas if you want to start running locally? How likely are you to crash things? How fast or slow is this? Like, what, what does that end up looking like? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you're unlikely to crash things, especially like, so I'm working on um, a 2021 MacBook Pro with an M1 chip. Uh, it's pretty old. It's three years old. It's a very old device. And it works just fine. It's pretty much impossible to crash unless you really get around it. For example, the macOS kernel is really extremely world-class at making sure you don't crash the system. There's plenty of safeguards in place. So what will typically happen is your application itself will freeze, so not your entire system. And at some point it will say, hey, this thing's taking too long. Do you want to force it to quit? And the kernel will just pull the kill switch. Very cool. There's a way around this. 
using a environment variable. So PyTorch is the thing that's causing the memory problems. PyTorch is an open source library from Meta that helps with machine learning. And so PyTorch allows you to set an environment variable called MPS high watermark ratio. And this is at what point do you, you know, throw an out of memory exception? Because like the high watermark literally means you're about to reach the the watermark, the, the level where if this is a tide pool, you're going to start losing water. You know, you're going to overflow. Literally, I love the, the language we have in computer science, overflow, watermark, etc. So you set this, it's a threshold before overflow, at which point PyTorch will just kill the process. You can set that to zero, right? And then what will happen is you just completely bypass. So you're like, you know what? If we have an overflow, we have an overflow. I'll just like hard reboot. And so you set that to zero and then you'll crash your system uh, because all your GPU, all your CPU is going to be consumed and you're not going to have free resources to like respond to the caps lock key and turn the light green. You're not going to have resources to... So what you're saying is unless you go out of your way to tell your computer yeah. it's okay to crash, it's not going to crash. Um, and just to understand you referenced PyTorch, that's getting run by Olama under the covers or you're explicitly running that? No, no, I'm explicitly running it. I, I think, to be fair, Hugging Face Transformers runs it. Yeah, so my fine tunes, by the way, just to make this early accessible to everyone, is I, I do it through a Jupyter notebook. For those who aren't familiar with this, Jupyter is just a big JSON file that has like cells and each cell runs in isolation, but there's shared scope. So it's like a, it's literally, it looks like a notebook with code snippets and you can run those code snippets. It's, it's basically like text snippet, text snippet, text snippet, and you can run snippets in isolation and they share scope. So you can say like a var A equals one in a snippet somewhere high above, and then way down under a bunch of text, you could reference A and it will just know the value. And the reason I do this is because where there's these snippets in a notebook, there's also checkpoints. Meaning I could go up to the point where I run NPM install safely, and then the step after that could crash, but I'll still have my dependencies, you know? And so that's really cool for an iterative training process because with fine tuning and training machine learning models, you have to load a bunch of stuff into memory and sort of keep it there. And the loading takes time. So if the loading step crashes, then you have to load it again and again. So it, it's really cool that you're able to just load things into memory and run an inference later. And if the inference fails, the stuff's still in memory. Yeah. So unless you go out of your way, you're not going to crash things. I recommend going out of your way because you're still not going to like, we're, we're very protected. You're not worst case, your computer becomes fully unresponsive. And then you press and hold the power button for like 10 seconds and it just does a reboot and you're fine. Like nothing will explode. So it's worth playing. So coming back then, peeling back the layers, right? So if you wanted to get involved or start playing with this stuff, like the simplest thing, which most people have done, is you just go to one of these online services, right? You go to ChatGPT or something like that. You play with it there. You see, what can this thing do for me in this setting? Next layer is you're using some sort of local code. Maybe it's an agentic framework, something like that. But you're still interacting with an online model or, API. or an online API, right? You don't have to do anything. One layer beyond that, you're downloading Olama, running a, a local model of some sort. Now, let's talk briefly about like levels of local resources, right? So you're you're in a three-year-old MacBook Pro. I'm guessing something like 16 gigs of memory or something like mm -hmm. that. Like how much exactly. do you need to run these things locally? That's the cool thing about Olama. They will work on anything. And if they don't, they're explicit about it up front. So that's the promise with Olama is they detect your heart. It's sort of like Docker, right? You don't really think of like, what hardware am I working on? You just like in your Docker file, you're like from Ubuntu, whatever, like do it. And it will virtualize that for you. And Olama is exactly the same. So it really is, there's quite a bit of interop. Um, it'll work on three-year-old devices. It'll work on Windows. It'll work on Linux. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay. So now you've got your local model. Yeah. You're probably at this layer, still not fine tuning, but you're just running against a local model using your, your JavaScript, or I guess it looked like um, the Vercel SDK is TypeScript, so Nick Nisi will be happy. He'll be willing to play with it. Yeah. But... Uh, well, let me let me say this. You, you, if you want to go the local route, you, you need you need really just two things, and none of them are JavaScript, but you can add JavaScript later. We'll talk about that in a second. But just to make sure, just to get really clear, if you want to run any large language model, or frankly, any machine learning model locally, you just need two things. One is a very, very typically large file called the weights. And this is literally a neural network. It's think of it as a brain on your computer, right? These are like orders of gigabytes. So 70 gigabytes, sometimes terabytes. They're very, sometimes petabytes. They're very, very large. And what all they are, are big 
almost almost graph like data structures with a bunch of nodes and a bunch of edges and each node has a number associated with it like this is the think of it as like if you see a soundboard from an audio engineer's desk you know there's like a billion different knobs for like EQ settings and volume and stuff that's it right and so turning these knobs is how inference works uh, is how training works like setting the values on each knob is, is basically the training process so you have this huge file that's the weights and you have an inference engine, something to run the algorithm that those weights express. They take an input, they, they pass it through those weights and get a predicted output with some degree of certainty. Um, the inference engine, the lowest level of inference engine is something called Llama CPP. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it runs in C++. It's very, like for me, this is beyond the scope of my knowledge. Olama abstracts on top of Llama CPP. And, and just makes it more comfortable for people like me. Um, so you need those two files, that's it. Now, if you're running inference locally, meaning you can send input tokens, you get output tokens, you can say, hey, chat GPT, what's two plus four, you get six, or not chat GPT, hey, local model, what's two plus four, you get six, maybe. Um, then the inference engines typically expose a web API, or you can wrap it with a web API. Olama runs a web API on localhost. It's some weird port, like localhost port and like five digit thing. But once that's running locally, then you can just do a fetch request in JavaScript to it. The cool thing about Olama's HTTP API is that it's 100% open AI compatible. So you could literally like run an inference with ChatGPT, copy that as fetch and change the URL to instead of like, you know, chatgpt.com slash whatever, localhost port something slash whatever, and it will just work with your local model. Well, and that, that gives a really low barrier to entry for just hacking yes. around with code here because now suddenly you don't have to worry about a number of things. You don't have to worry about signing up for an API-based account on ChatGPT because that's a separate thing than their web interface. You don't have to worry about, are they stealing my data? What are they doing with it? Where is it going? You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Now, yes. what are the shortcomings, right? GPT-40, you mentioned, is sort of like state-of-the-art, highest power model. Like if I step down to using something like you're using Mixtral 8x22b, like how is that going to feel different? Oh, it's going to feel very different. <laughs> As a consequence of these models being ethical and open source, they kind of suck. It's like it's like <laughs> it's like okay. if anyone's um if anyone's used gone from like Adobe Photoshop to like the GIMP which was, I don't know if you remember, this was like the old open. I do remember GIMP. I, I spent a lot of time in GIMP because I didn't want to pay for Photoshop and it was miserable. Yeah, exa it's exactly like that. It's like going from Mac OS to Linux. <laughs> it's the tax of open source. It just really, really sucks. But you can work around it, right? You can, through some system prompt engineering, through some rag, and honestly, through fine tuning, there's a model called Mistral 7B Instruct. It was like purpose built for fine tuning. And so this is this is the secret sauce. This is what people should be doing, is you work with a crappy model, and over time, you tend to get some really good inferences. And so you collect all your good inferences, pair them up with the prompts that led to them, and then use those to fine tune a smaller model, like Mistral 7B Instruct. And then you've got a really high quality model that's specialized at, at what you want. And then you can run it locally, and it's gonna be better than, it will probably outperform GPT-40 for your use cases, because it it's just more intimately knows your data. Yeah, well, and this, I think, highlights one of the things that going to these smaller models does is it peels back, once again, the layers of, like, if you go and interact with ChatGPT, it can kind of just feel like magic. And that's dangerous because it means that you assume that it's better than it is. You assume that it can do all of these different things and it will try and it will look good in a lot of different ways, but it's so powerful that yeah. it demos incredibly well. It gets really, really close most of the time out of the box. And it's hard to see, like, what is actually happening under there? It just, it feels magical. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. No, especially tool calling feels so magical, right? How does, how does it call a function? What? But this is just training data, text in, text out. Yeah. So you, you get down to those smaller models and you start to see that a little bit more raw. And you say, oh. Yeah. It's just, it's just making shit up based on pattern matching. And you can get better at how you present patterns to it. You can teach it the patterns that matter to you. Yes. And it will then produce patterns that also matter more to you. I think also what's worth noting is the large language models themselves don't really call any tools, right? They they return data, they return text that then a layer in front of them on OpenAI's side or whatever vendor 
can reason about the format of string it produced and then call the function. So it's not like the large language models have function calling capabilities. They have text generation capabilities. They'll just generate like some JSON. Like think of an object with URL this and parameters that. And then your API that talks to the language model will receive this string, parse it, and then call a tool and then return text after that. So like you said, it, it seems magical, but it's just layers of APIs on layers of APIs. Well, and you can, you can peel back the layers on that too, even within like a chat GPT, just ask it to, to render JSON or ask it to render YAML. It turns out it, YAML is a really nice language for large language models compared to JSON because it encodes meaning in the spaces and it like mm. is very human readable, which means it's very close to language, which means it's something they grok really well. But yeah, you can do all sorts of things. You can ask it to, instead of just outputting an answer, output three answers, output a summary of your conversation so far inside a summary tag, and then your answer. Okay, sure, it will do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I just, I want people to know that it's, it's not magic. And I do want people to also like care about the, the magician behind the magic, you know? I think that's that's really gonna be important for us as we move forward um, in the AI age. Also, one thing I, I wanna clarify, and this is speculative, but I think there's a lot of positive valence casting on like, oh my gosh, OpenAI released ChatGPT and it was so great and they did good for humanity and so on. But if we balance that out a little bit with what we know about uh, big tech and capitalism, I think another side that's worth discussing that I just don't see us discussing enough is the idea that they just really needed human feedback because the way you make these language models really great is through a technique called RLHF or reinforcement learning with human feedback. They need people to do text generations at scale and you know click on the thumbs up or thumbs down because this helps them create new models. New Like GPE-4 is just a successor to GPE-3.5 because 100 million users used it and then clicked on thumbs up and thumbs down and they use those to fine tune GPE-3.5 and so on and so on. So without that, OpenAI wouldn't, be OpenAI today. And I think that's that's another reason to, so it's not, I, I challenge the idea that it's just like fully altruistic, like we're gonna give something good to humanity and do research. They also need us as much as we need it, so. Yeah, well, and I think this gets into a little bit, of, like one of the challenges being a software developer is we tend to jump to binaries. We like to, to nail things down. And so I talk with a lot of developers who are either AI is the future of everything or possibly even more common, this stuff is all bull Just not good for anything. And I think what's much more interesting to me is like the line along the way of saying like the hype machine is the hype machine. It's going to do what it's going to do. It's going to go crazy. And a lot of the stuff they're saying is not there. And as you highlight, like they have their reasons for doing it, right? Like Sam Altman's not out there talking about AGI because he actually thinks it's coming. He's doing that because it pumps up open AI. <laughs> And it gets all sorts of outcomes that he wants out of it. Like he's not, as far as I can tell, an altruist in any of that. Yeah, and also, should they discover AGI, they have a, an incentive to not reveal that they've discovered AGI, right? Because it would give Microsoft and the stakeholders an enormous advantage in the market. So why, why would you then share that or open source that unless you absolutely have to? But how can you absolutely have to unless you have people overlooking you and holding you accountable to do that, which as far as I know, they don't. So. Yeah, it's it's worth, I think those discussions are exceedingly important as AI continues to grow in maturity. Hey friends, I'm here with Brian Clark, VP of product at Neon. You know, we use Neon. We love Neon. So Brian, you're both a fan and a listener of the show. So you kind of know what our shows are about, who we reach. And of those folks that listen to our podcasts, what do you think they need to know most about Neon? I think the thing I found in talking to developers is that they really don't understand, they don't understand database branching. Sometimes they'll say, is it expensive or is it slow? Or like, I don't really understand where it fits in. And so we're changing the, the face of it a bit to like maybe focus less on branching because that's the tool and more on like, maybe calling it database previews. So you can better see how it fits into your development environment. The more people can understand, oh, I get it. Like, hey, any changes you make, they don't affect production. Like this is a separate copy. The cost of those changes 
is only the difference between production and whatever changes you made. So if you deleted a bunch of things or added new data, things like that, you're only actually paying the difference because we use copy on write. So I think it's like these sets of things is what I have the team really focused on. Getting people to really grasp database preview environments and then like, what's the advantage? And like, can I use it in my system? And that's where I'm like, yeah, like you should be taking this system on. Like this will increase your confidence. It doesn't cost a lot, it's super fast. That idea isn't out there. And I think it's because it's not in most products. Most databases don't have this kind of integration. Okay, so a concern I've heard out there is why not just run Postgres local? Why database branching? Why preview branches? However you want to frame it. A serverless managed in the cloud Postgres may be more latent or slower than a local copy. It may cost more. There's more storage. Debunk this. Help me understand the true cost, the true speed. Lay it on me. So in a pull request, like a preview environment, this system is fast. So Neon databases spin up in 500 milliseconds or less. You're not affecting the speed of your CI CD system at all. The copy on write for our storage means that there's no actual operation. It's like a kind of a null operation when we create a branch. You instantly have access to the production data, but nothing has changed. Only until you start writing do we actually save the differences there. Yeah, you're not paying for extra, extra data. It's not like you're creating a fork and then you like allocate a whole other 200 gigabyte storage system and a whole other separate compute. We attach compute directly to the original storage. Yeah, those things are super fast and that's in the, the pull request environment. For the most part on your desktop environment, your laptop environment, you won't notice a slowdown there. Um, and you can do reset and things like that. So you can make a bunch of changes. You can use our CLI and do branch reset and it'll just reset with whatever the parent branch was. But I, I completely understand that the need for people to want to have a purely local environment uh, and I want to get there. So Neon is super fast production managed serverless databases that are basically never idle. They wake up in less than 500 milliseconds. That's fast. It's managed, it scales, it branches. What else do you need? Learn more at neon.tech. That's N-E-O-N dot tech. Neon dot tech. The question I'm kind of leading to here is, how do you think about kind of where to use this stuff, where it's going to fit in application development in the future. Like obviously, as we've highlighted, it's really easy to get started playing with it and you can do it with JavaScript. You're using it to do real work with your uh, podcast agents. They are making it easier for you to do what you wanted to do. How do you see this playing out in the ecosystem? Yeah, I, I will add, we at the podcast grew in terms of production efficiency by 100%. We literally doubled the amount of episodes we ship from once a week to twice a week because of the agentic workflows. And it's it's me. There, there's no one else that works on this podcast other than me and a bunch of agents. And, you know, each episode is nearly two hours and it's, it's quite a bit of work, but that's the power of agents. Where can people use this? I think that's a really great question. I think we just have to get curious a little bit because as I mentioned, anything that you could do with a human that is even yourself. I could I could produce all this podcast stuff myself manually, right? But there's a better way. And so I think where people can use this is in the places that they're already spending manual energy. So for example, I know runners, people who will go for a run and they'll get into Strava and look at their stats and be like, oh, I was slow today or I was fast today. What if you didn't have to do that? You just go for your run, jump in the shower, come out, and you just have a summary like, hey, this is how you stacked up to like all the other workouts. And and it's not reactive where you're like having to send a prompt and get a get a response. It's proactive. Like you literally like just go about your day and somewhere your agent interrupts you with like, just so you know, your run today was actually better than your past like three efforts in the same route. Things like that. Or another place people can use this is, so I think Apple intelligence actually is going to change the game on this because Apple intelligence makes AI personal, I think for the first time ever. And I think what they're not maybe not talking about, but I think this future is coming, is the age of not just personal AI, but proactive AI. So not reactive, I send you a prompt, you send me your generation. It's more 
I'm just going to go about my day and you're going to tell me things that are super useful. For example, you know, I, I could have a calendar event next week for lunch with um, Yanni Evacalio and I forget about it, right? And so I go play tennis and then I come back from tennis and my AI agent is like, hey, just so you know, you have a lunch with Yanni next week um, and there's no location in the calendar invite. By the way, you the last time you both talked, you liked this place. So I went and made a reservation for you and it's attached to the calendar invite now. That whole thing just happens, right? And that can happen with agentic work. So I think this is where people will end up using it or should end up using it. Um, we don't live in that future today, but we will. And I think there's companies to be started there and open source projects to be made and a lot of stuff there. Am I going to start one of these companies? Absolutely not. I just don't care enough. I, <laughs> like I care about the, we talked about this, Kevin. I care about the the novelty and the, not not so much the novelty, but the the complexity of it. I care about how it works and knowing how it works and the, the person behind the curtain but I know all that. And, and that sort of removes the fun from building it because cool, yes, I, I, I can. And so it's this weird thing where when I recognize I can build something, I don't, you know, but when, I, when, I, when I'm chasing the knowledge, then I build a bunch of stuff so anyway. So it sounds like essentially think about what you're doing today that you would rather not be doing and see if you can figure out how to get an AI to do it. Yeah, because like, I, was, I was just gonna say, one of the things that I think people talk about is this future where the machines take over and then what do we do? You know, the, the doomer theory. And some people see this as a good thing, right? Like the machines run everything and we just like paint all day and eat pizza and chill and do sports and whatever we want. I think we could make that future. Like you said, do the thing, like, you know, automate away the things you don't want to do with agents and just live your life. So that's sort of what I would do. That's what I'm doing actually with my podcast. One of the things that I've found playing with these tools is at least in their current state, they're really not good at things like decision making, but they're pretty good at, I want you to do a thing, go and do it. Especially if you're willing to spend some time to like figure out how do I tune this prompt? How do I write the right tools? Or how do I ask the AI to write the right tools, get it to do things? And so I think there's kind of an interesting question there around, you know, can we use these tools to get rid of the dredge work, but then elevate the interesting decision making, ideation, exploration pieces? In your example that you shared, Personally, I wouldn't want it to book a restaurant, but I'd want it to suggest it and say, hey, here's the restaurant. Do you want me to book it? And then I can make that decision and then it can go and do the, the work for me. Yeah. And, and, you know, dialing in that threshold is, I think, also where a lot of the complexity in the work is. So I think Apple Intelligence, again, goes, does this really well, right? Where it uses OpenAI's models as a tool, literally. It, 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 we talked about tool calling. Apple Intelligence, they have a small on-device model that does tool calling, but to another LLM. And I think that that's pretty cool. And I think we'll see a lot of that as well. Well, I think that's that's the model that, for me, I want to bring this back to, to for developers, right? Like, the danger is either you dismiss these as they're not useful at all, or you think they're magic and they'll do everything. They're just tools. They're useful tools. They create some new capabilities, some very powerful capabilities, but we need to figure out how we incorporate those tools in the software we're writing. Yeah. And there was this scientist, the godfather of AI, Dr. Hinton, right, who was working at Google and who left Google so that he could speak more freely about the dangers of AI. And he mentioned that within the next few years, I forget how many, I think it was 20 or so years, forgive me. But he says within the next few years, there's a 50-50 chance that artificial intelligence will be smarter than human beings. And if you listen to him speak, it sounds like really dangerous and scary. It sounds like, and he says, you know, the only instance in existence that we have where something less capable controls something more capable is when a baby controls the mother to feed it. But like, this is rare. There's no other instance where something less capable controls something more capable. And so his, his theory is that in the next 20 or so years, there's a 50-50 chance that we'll achieve ASI or artificial super intelligence, and this will be more capable than us, therefore it will control us. But I tend to not agree with this very much. And, and it's kind of stupid for me to like disagree with such a you know, established person, right? But at this time in history, there's like robotics is the bottleneck. Like, so what if ASI controls us and is smart? We just like, it can't really do anything in the physical world at this point in time. And so, yes, maybe, you know, some systems will go wrong and things will be deleted or whatever. Restaurants will be booked, but we'll, we'll recognize we messed up and adjust it. We always do. We did like with the airline industry, this was new. And in the, when it was nascent, 
planes would literally fall out of the sky. There's so many incidents of like Pan Am and KLM and Cathay Pacific having all kinds of issues, but now it's the safest way to travel. And I think that's part of the human story is that we'll introduce the right safety measures and it'll, it'll be okay. We'll make mistakes along the way, but I think we'll, we'll get there. I also feel like there's a little bit around the development of AI that reminds me of fusion in the sense that like people have been saying we're five to 10 years away from fusion power for the last 60 years. And we maybe will get there, but like it just keeps being there. And I feel like that has been true in the AI world as well. People are like, oh my gosh, we're going to match human intelligence in the next 10 years. And like, you can find people saying that going back almost as far as there are computers, because I think part of it is you get so into thinking about these computers that you maybe don't realize the extent of what actually happens in human intelligence. Like we do a lot more than next token prediction. Yeah. Although, although the thing that makes us human that sets us apart from lesser animals is the prefrontal cortex is the activity is the center of the brain that literally literally just does predictions and and based on those predictions will either you know will quiet down other circuits or raise their activity um, will inhibit or excite but like predictions are so crucial to the human experience and so i think it's important to not undervalue that but also not overvalue it and so next token prediction is still prediction you know on some level so we will see. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, yeah. I think my personal opinion, this is another example of our um, ability to get fooled into thinking S curves are exponentials. Are there any things that you, that we haven't talked about that you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I work at Datastack, so I'd love it if they check out our tools. We make, we make a vector database that's super useful for similarity search. But I think one thing that we make that not, not enough people are hyped about, as I am, is something called Langflow. It's a low-code and no-code builder for RAG and other Gen AI workflows. It's really cool. So like you, you have this drag-and-drop style interface where you can generate RAG pipelines and other things. And it, it makes these things more accessible. This is what I'm excited about, right? It's the democratization of Gen AI. It makes it more accessible to a wider net of people. And, you know, I was talking to Swix, Sean Wang, the founder of Small AI, and he mentioned, dude, it's like the internet just began. And there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of room at the table. And so a lot of our work ought to be spent on making this stuff accessible. So that's what I'm really into. That's what I would in invite people to do as well, is, is come and play. And if there's questions you have and if there's support you need, I'm here. Um, Kevin, you're here. A bunch of us are, you know, we've been around for a little bit longer and we're happy to support you. Absolutely. Yeah, this stuff is going fast, but despite like all of the hype around how many people have tried it and all these different things, it's still very early days. We haven't figured out how to use these things effectively in very many instances. I love this agent example that you have because it is concrete, visible, and it has clearly accelerated your work. And I think there's many, many more opportunities out there. So yeah, let's let's close with that. Of It's early days. You can still get involved in this stuff. I do think it is going to transform our industry. So I think the head in the sand approach is probably not the right one. Like if you're looking for what's your next learning thing, maybe not the next front end framework. Instead, look at stately AI and how you can interact with LLMs using TypeScript. Yeah. All right. With that, thank you, Tejas. I'm K-Ball, and this has been JS Party. Catch you all next week. Next up on the pod. Nick and Chris are joined by Josh Goldberg to discuss the latest updates from ESLint, TypeScript ESLint, and the new flat config format. Subscribe now. If you haven't already, head to jsparty.fm for all the ways. And if you're missing out on our weekly changelog newsletter slash podcast, pop in your email address and join 22,000 plus forward-looking devs who keep up the easy way by letting me do it for them. Get in on it at changelog.com slash news. Special thanks to our partners at Fly.io and to our longtime sponsors, Sentry. Save 100 bucks off the team plan by using code changelog when you sign up at sentry.io. And of course, thank you to Breakmaster Cylinder, our beat freak in residence. I'm here for your sound needs. If you dig our beats, do yourself a favor and type changelog beats into Spotify, Apple Music, or your favorite music streaming platform. Thank me later. 
That is all for now, but come back and party with us again next week.